Hello, and welcome to My Sex Bio. Um, my name is Pierce Delahunt. I am your uh, facilitator for the series uh, Fucking Capitalism. Um, gonna do the usual disclaimers. Um, I call myself a social emotional leftist. I'm an activist educator. I've been talking about this uh, and, and doing this kind of work uh, for a while. And also, I'm a very privileged person. And uh, I do not profit off of the proceeds uh, from uh, attending my sex bios workshops, which I do encourage you to check out. Um, any proceeds that go to uh, that that uh, you pay from attending fucking capitalism goes to uh, my sex bios other staff and their operations. Um, great. Uh, this uh, month's theme of July, we're going to be talking about uh, a. Uh, the theme is sex addiction. We're going to take that to be addiction more broadly and political economy. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy. Um, if you haven't seen the political economy intro video, I encourage you to check that out. This is just uh, up there as a reminder for that. Uh, but we're going to dive right into the theme. Great. Um, so I call this talk uh, bars of the cage. And what do I mean by that? Uh, we'll get into. Uh, first, though, we're going to talk about something called the default mode network. Now, the default mode network is uh, a, a network of parts of the brain uh, that light up basically uh, in uh, unfocused rest is what it's kind of called. Uh, and it it's we experience it as kind of our self-talk. It's the brain chatter when when we don't have anything to do in that way. Um, and the default mode network itself can be pleasant or unpleasant. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it often gets talked about in kind of trauma spaces. Um, and so in those contexts, the default mode network is seen as this like scary thing, but, um, we can have a default mode network that we actually enjoy. And that's part of the work of healing from trauma. Um, and, so this is something that I, I want to use as kind of like the the framework of where we're coming from when we're talking about addiction, because there's many ways to understand addiction. But one of those ways is that addiction is a hyper learning, a learning too much of whatever it is we're doing that reduces or shuts down the default mode network. Um, and very importantly, that can be uh chemicals uh like alcohol and other drugs um or it can be things that we do because remember the default mode network is active during uh unfocused tasks um so if we have a focused task to do um then that will also tamper down the default mode network um studies have shown that video games are super effective at reducing the activity of the default mode network um, a lot of people uh, trying to quit cigarettes report that the the activity of the cigarettes is still something that they're they're experiencing really strongly. Um, and importantly, uh, especially in the context of talking about uh, sex addiction, uh, we the, the there's a controversy around whether sex uh, sex addiction counts as an addiction uh, and. Um, I think it's very clear that you can be addicted to all kinds of things. Gambling is an addiction. Why couldn't sex addiction be one? Uh, social media uh, is something that we can be addicted to. Um, I think that there is a, a way that like reading tweets or Instagram posts or memes is actually uh, more addictive, right, than reading a large book because of uh, that, that kind of focused task. Like you only have one little tweet to read and then you can get hooked on that in a way that you wouldn't get hooked on reading a long book necessarily it's still possible um gabor mate uh, a really uh, wonderful uh 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 person who studies um all kinds of things around trauma and addiction and and uh all kinds of uh, things around this stuff uh he himself reports about having been addicted to uh buying uh classical music on cds and he actually uh missed one of his he's a doctor he missed one of his uh patients uh births apparently uh because he was so overcome with the urge the compulsion to to buy a cd that had classical music on um so that's a little bit of the frame that we can in fact be addicted to all kinds of things um so 
uh, just to, to ground us in that. Um, so this is the intrapersonal uh, discussion around uh, addiction. Just going to keep it really simple. Not going to go into any more neuroscience than that. Um, but the, that's the internal stuff. So now we're going to move into the interpersonal stuff, the stuff uh, between people. Um, and this I pull from a, a practitioner, a healthcare practitioner named Lisa Rankin. Um, and uh, she went through uh, Western medical training and got tired of what she describes as the tell me your problem and I'll give you a pill culture of Western medicine. And then she got trained in Eastern medicine and she got tired of what she calls her words, the tell me your problem and I'll give you an herb culture of Eastern medicine. And so uh, she ended up developing her own practice that uh, when you go in, you fill out an entire lifestyle questionnaire talking about uh, all, all kinds of things. Everything here you see on this, uh, it's called the whole health care. Um, and uh, the story she tells uh, about about doing this as a, as a demonstrative example is that um, someone came in and was having trouble sleeping and she said, can you, can you give me something to help me sleep? And uh, Lisa Rankin, she looked, Dr. Lisa Rankin, she looked through the, uh, the questionnaire and she said, listen, like you're in an abusive relationship. You have a precarious financial situation. You have no creative expression. Uh, and you are feeling purposeless. Like there's, there's not a lot I can give you for your sleep. Like these are the things you need to address. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's the kinds of, it, it's part of the culture that we've created that we, uh, are running away from our, uh, our trauma and the things that like life is asking us to confront that, um, that actually lend itself to creating the conditions for increases in addiction. Um, and as examples of that, now we're going to move into uh, talking about the Rat Park experiments. And I want to be very clear here that I absolutely condemn these experiments. I think they're they're uh, horrible and torturous. Um, and uh, they are established experiments and we can learn a lot from them. Um, but this comes from a web comic by that writer there, Stuart McMillan. Um, the uh, basic understanding of the Rat Park situation, the experiments, is that at one point, uh, first, there were experiments done, I think, in the 70s that uh, showed that rats in cages uh, would rather have uh, heroin or cocaine than water. And that was because, as we understood it at the time, uh, that uh, the chemicals themselves of heroin or cocaine uh, were very addictive. And once you have some, your brain learns, hyper learns, learns too much that it needs more and more and more. Um, and that happened uh, with the rats in the experiment to the point that uh, all of them became addicted and the majority of them uh, OD'd to the point of death. Um, and that was our standard model of understanding how uh, chemicals and experiments work for a while. And then uh, the Rat Park experiments came. And that's when some people took a look, uh, researchers took a look at that experiment and they said, well, wait a minute, these rats were alone by themselves, uh, each in a different cage, uh, in a situation that if we had done that to humans, we would call that solitary confinement and torture and a war crime. Not that ac that actually stops us from doing it to humans either. Um, but uh, they're in such a horrible situation that the only thing they are given that can be pleasurable is heroin. Of course, they're going to fucking get addicted to heroin. And of course, uh, the majority of them are going to uh, overdose to the point of death in that situation. So uh, the researchers of the Rat Park experiments uh, took the original experiments and, and made that new experiment, basically the control group, but then they also had an addition to that. You can kind of see a little schematic of it in this drawing here. Um, they created an open air uh, area that, that was like a playpen where they had uh, wood chips uh, shavings on the ground. Uh, they had uh, exercise to, uh, toys that they could run around on those little wheels and stuff um, to, to have uh, like physical engagement. 
they made it pretty, they painted it. And very, very importantly, they also had other rats to be in community with. Um, and they found, the researchers found that when they did this, um, not only did not a single rat ever overdose to the point of death on the cocaine uh, or the heroin, um, but not a single rat even got addicted. Uh, they, they actually mostly didn't bother with it at all. They tried it and the, the researchers made sure to, to get them to try it at least once, but it was there. So they gave it a shot, but then they saw what it did to them and that they couldn't be present in community with their, uh, their, their rat, uh, people. Um, and they said, no, thank you. And some of them actually, uh, took to it a little bit. They, they were engaging in uh, what we might call recreational use of heroin, which is something that a lot of people actually believe is impossible uh, in, in humans. Um, and I understand that not every experiment on rats is something that we can directly translate to humans, um, but there are a plethora of experiments uh, and social uh, and natural experiments that have happened that do demonstrate this. Uh, I'm just using the rat park experiments as, as an example because I think it's very illustrative. Um, but uh, to get to the point about uh, being able to take heroin and actually not become addicted, there are a number of examples that uh, Johan Hari refers to in his work. And we're going to talk about him a little bit more later. Uh, so hold on that. But um, Johan Hari talks about uh, Vietnam War veterans coming back from the war and having used heroin extensively there. And there was actually a lot of talk and a lot of fear around uh, now all of a sudden we're going to see a huge spike in, in uh, drug crime. And it didn't happen. Um, we have people taking heroin for pain that they are prescribed. And yes, there is an opiates problem in the United States. And if... Uh, if the drugs worked the way that we understood just from the original rat park experiments, that it's just a chemical thing. If you take it, you get it hooked. Um, we would have way more people hooked on, on the opiates than we currently do. Um, so that's some example. But now, if you notice, we've started at the internal, we went into interpersonal, but now we're moving to the institutional stuff. So in the rat park experiments, the researchers actually play the role of the public policy people. The rats are still engaging in the interpersonal decisions, um, but the, the researchers themselves in the one community, they play a role of we're going to invest in uh, uh, the social welfare and community of these rats. We're going to create uh, situations that facilitate rats to be in relationship with each other and to explore themselves much more than in this other situation, we're playing the role of uh, we're basically uh, torturing these rats um, and making those institutional decisions. One, we know reduces addiction basically down to zero. And the other one, we know increases addiction basically to 100%. Um, and that is going to bring us to uh, the war on drugs. Uh, which this is uh, another web comic from the same uh, the same writer uh, Stuart McMillan, um, and in this web comic he's talking about uh, a letter that Milton Friedman wrote to Richard Nixon when Richard Nixon began pushing uh, the war on drugs, um, and Milton Friedman explains. And I want to be clear here: I also condemn Milton Friedman, um, but uh, the there's a point that I'm going to be making with this. Um, Milton Friedman is uh, critiquing the, uh, the, the way that Richard Nixon wants to go about this. And uh, you, you know, you can, you can sometimes trust libertarians to criticize the, the government. They, they, can, they can at least do that much some of the time. Sometimes their critiques of the government even don't, don't work out super well. But um, so Milton Friedman explains that a war on drugs, quote unquote, would actually create the conditions that would accelerate, that would increase addiction. And he explains why. Um, and there's a fatal flaw that Milton Friedman makes in his uh, opposition to Richard Nixon. And I'm going to talk about that toward the end. 
But uh, that's a, that's a point that I want to drive home is that the war on drugs actually creates the conditions for addiction. Um, but moving on, we're gonna we're gonna uh, talk about that and address that at the end. So that brings us to then. So we so you heard where the name of the talk comes from: bars of the cage. It comes from these uh, experiments on on these rats that are stuck in this cage. We're not in. Uh, a cage, most of us, not some of us actually are. Um, but at the same time, uh, we're in a, a, a society created by public policy. So what are our cages? What are the bars of our cage? And I would argue that they are capitalism's alienations. And that brings us to uh, uh, Johan Hari's work. Um, so this one book over here called Chasing the Scream. Johan Hari particularly looks at the relationship between uh, capitalism uh, and uh, addiction and drugs. And there's a whole lot that we're going to talk about from there. And then in the other book, uh, Lost Connections, uh, Johan Hari goes through the relationship between uh, capitalism and depression and anxiety. And I'm going to be kind of bringing the two together in this. But the point that Johan Hari makes in Lost Connections is that researchers have actually already identified uh, nine different uh, parameters that uh, predispose people or not to having anxiety and depression, two of which are the ones that we focus on so much in, in our mainstream discourse, uh, which are uh, genes and neurochemistry, how, how the uh, drugs and chemicals play out in our brain. Um, the other seven are all social factors, and we're going to go through those here. Uh, I'm just going to name the, the conditions uh, first on the, the part outside of the parentheses here. So we have meaningful work, being connected to meaningful work, how connected we are to meaningful work, how connected we are to other people, how connected we are to meaningful values, to childhood trauma, status and respect, the natural world, hopeful and secure future. And then finally, uh, the genes and neurochemistry again. So those are the things that uh, researchers have concluded predispose people to having depression or anxiety or not, uh, how connected we are to those things. Um, so then I'm gonna talk about uh, how capitalism alienates us from each one of those things at every level. And uh, that, we're, that now we're getting into what's on the parentheses on the other side. So. We'll start with meaningful work. Uh, this is just a straightforward Marxist uh, concept of alienation, where if if the purpose of our work uh, or the effect of our work, if the effect of our work is that we show up for eight hours a day and what did we do? We made our boss more wealthy. That's what we did, right? Uh, then we are alienated from the value created by our labor meaning that we are alienated from the meaning of our labor itself. Um, so that that is just a straightforward Marxist concept, alienation, uh, and it uh, the, the worker exploitation under capitalism uh, actually cuts us off from meaningful work. Um, other people, how does capitalism alienate us from that? One of the ways that we can understand capitalism, one of the phrases we can use to describe it is uh, capitalism is the ruthless commodification of everything that exists. And that creates a, a transaction economy rather than what we used to live under uh, long before was a gift economy where everything was relationally based, right? So under a transaction economy, any gift I can make to someone is actually a liability because now I'm giving away something for free. Whereas what I'm trying to do under capitalism is accumulate as much as possible. And, uh, and so I, I, don't, I never want to give anything away for free. I want more tit for tat. And then that actually, uh, that dynamic encourages me to see other people as commodities that then I can extract value from in some way. Um, so that's how capitalism alienates us from other people. Meaningful values. How does capitalism do that? Uh, so Johan Hari will talk about how uh, we understand that eating junk food will give us junk health. Uh, and will will make us physically sick. And in the same way, uh, having what Johan Hari refers to as junk values will make us spiritually sick. Um, and uh, capitalism pushes racism, sexism, ableism, ageism, 
it pushes us to be disconnected from our own selves and our own feelings so that we can go on with the the labor that we need to perform in order to uh, survive uh, so that we, we can't even address our healing. Um, and so uh, capitalism actually alienates us from meaningful values in order to go on existing so we can pay the rent. Um, and it in, in, in pushes us to internalize these horrible values of supremacy that we all have, that we have all internalized in some capacity, and that it takes a lifelong journey to uproot from ourselves. Um, so that's how capitalism alienates us from meaningful values. Childhood trauma. Uh, I want to be clear here, connecting to our childhood trauma doesn't mean that we want to fester in it or be traumatized, right? Connecting to our childhood tra trauma just means addressing it and confronting it and facing it and going through the process of that healing. Um, whereas capitalism encourages us to suppress that because healing is messy work and healing and, and any messy work and healing especially gets in the way of our having to perform labor for people that want to exploit our labor. Um, so, uh, the, and, and it encourages also able, uh, ageism where we end up just further traumatizing our children because now we're suppressed and now we're pushing that on other people and we're uh, telling them what they need to do and encouraging that. And there's a whole way that we can, there's a, that's a whole other uh, uh, presentation. Any one of these can be, but, um, but yeah, how capitalism pushes ageism and, and uh, child abuse. Um, not to mention the, uh, the, oh, the, disproportionate overrepresentation of, of children in our incarceration system and uh, including in solitary confinement about how we're uh, actually enacting torture on uh, a lot of young people in the United States today. Um, so then uh, that's how capitalism alienates us from childhood trauma. We're disconnected from it, um, but we're still enacting childhood trauma everywhere. Uh, so alienating from status and respect. Now here, status and respect, uh, we, in our uh, lefty circles, uh, can be uh, kind of thought of in a negative light, but we all have these needs for status and respect. It's just that under a capitalist model, uh, the way that we acquire status and respect is through a lot of violence. And that's through supremacy, through pushing other people down to raise ourselves up so that then we can claim that status and respect uh, rather than status and respect from living in integrity or, or uh, uh, adopting some other kinds of values that we have or status and respect through uh, service to others, for example. Um, but capitalism alienates us from each other and alienates us from these meaningful values. So then the only ways that capitalism leaves for us to, uh, to uh, connect to status and respect is the way that it profits uh, off of itself which is through pushing other people down and through further exploitation. And the more that capitalism turns us all against each other, the more that capitalism can profit. Um, then the natural world. I think that that's probably a more obvious one, uh, is that capitalism has brought about uh, climate catastrophe and uh, the, the sixth mass extinction uh, in, the, in planetary history. Um, but uh, two points there that maybe are lesser known is that the capitalism operates off of something called the enclosures. We all used to live in the commons. Um, and I am fully aware that there's something called the tragedy of commons and that that, that is actually a myth. Um, it's actually the tragedy of open access alongside privatization. Uh, what, what came out, the work that uh, the tragedy of the commons came out of was just a thought experiment that was never actually studied. Uh, the commons is actually... Uh, uh, one of the most successful uh, models of living that we we have uh, been able to to experience. Um, so uh, the enclosures then are to privatize a commons and then to divvy it up and then rent it back out to the people who already were uh, living with it and in uh, in, in communion and in relationship with those commons. And one way that that is is land. So the entire continent of Turtle Island that I happen to be on uh, was was stolen uh, is an, and an enclosure uh, and then rented out back to us where everyone who was living on this land uh, before uh, the enclosures were enjoying it without having to pay rent to anyone. Uh, and then, of course, there's extraction, uh, digging up for oil or uh, or whatever minerals there might be. 
um, and violently uh, destroying the land in order to do that. Uh, so that's how capitalism alienates us from the natural world. Um, and how does capitalism alienate us from a hopeful and secure future? Uh, well, again, we have climate catastrophe where we're uh, uh, making uh, our own society uh, more fragile and and uh, creating the conditions that uh, the the environment that it rests on is uh, more uh, or less stable over time. Um, so uh, we don't have the hopeful secure secure future in that way. Plus, plus the stratification of people, uh, such that uh, if if we're living under uh, a stratification of people where we have the supremacy and the internalized isms and 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 all that, um, then where we are in that placement uh, no longer is a place of security, a source of security or hope. Because how are we going to get out of that? except by uh, enacting more violence onto people. Um, so that's how capitalism alienates us from hope, uh, a hopeful and secure future. And then finally, even the genes and the brain changes, the neurochemistry and stuff, um, even that, I'm going to argue that capitalism uh, creates the conditions uh, for uh, uh, anxiety and depression and addiction uh, at the level of genes and brain changes because all of the trauma that I've named here um, lives on. They've done those studies that, uh, that through epigenetics, uh, we uh, pass down our trauma even intergenerationally. Uh, and that's been shown, especially with uh, Holocaust survivors, as well as uh, native genocide survivors, um, that their, their grandchildren and great grandchildren still exhibit the, the trauma through the epigenetics. So even at that level, uh, we are predisposed to anxiety and depression. And of course, that is going to predispose us to, uh, to uh, drug use or, or addiction more broadly, however it is that we use uh, uh, or whatever it is that we do or use to tamper down that default mode network so that we can quiet down all of the, that trauma uh, that uh, expresses itself in the default mode network. And that finally brings me to that, uh, that point about the fatal flaw that Milton Friedman was making in his uh, opposition to Richard Nixon about the war on drugs, is that the war on drugs was never about reducing addiction in the first place. And to help illustrate that point, uh, I want to share the story of Harry Anslinger, Judy Garland, and Billie Holiday, uh, which Johan Hari will talk about in his books and presentations. And also another resource I have in the, in the list uh, will also talk about. But Harry Anslinger was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics uh, and was therefore in charge of and hugely influential in uh, setting up uh, the United States drug policy uh, for all time after him. And uh, there were two people, prominent people, uh, who were struggling with heroin uh, that are relevant to this story. One uh, was Billie Holiday, who uh, was very famously singing the song Strange Fruit, uh, which the, the song title, Strange Fruit, is a metaphor for uh, the black people hanging from the trees who have been lynched. Um, and the song itself uh, was very powerful, the performance of which uh, was said to be very powerful. I wish I could have seen it. Um, and Billie Holiday uh, famously vomited uh, at, at every instance that she was performing it. Um, but that song uh, really was impactful on the audience that she was performing it to. Um, and of course that song was a critique to the United States system and how, given how impactful it was, it was a threat. Whereas Judy Garland, uh, was, uh, like America's sweetheart, nothing, no shade to Judy Garland, uh, for being America's sweetheart. Um, but, uh, but she just was not a threat to, uh, the, the capitalist system. Um, and Harry Anslinger. And uh, the the law enforcement law enforcement broadly hammered down Billie Holiday uh, to the point and the to the point that 
Uh, she was in the hospital handcuffed and the authorities refused to allow her to have methadone and they killed her because of that. Uh, in doing that, they killed her. Um, whereas Judy Garland, when she was going through her heroin crisis, uh, Harry Anslinger actually personally said, uh, take a vacation, you know, get some rest, take all the time you need to, to kind of get yourself kind of, uh, in resourced basically. Um, and of course this demonstrates that Harry Anslinger and our system knows what to do about people who have addiction and how we can support them. But of course that was never the point because Harry Anslinger wasn't interested in trying to help Billie Holiday recover from addiction. Harry Anslinger was trying to stop Billie Holiday from threatening the system of power that he was invested in. And it is precisely that that is the purpose of the war on drugs. It was never about getting people to stop taking drugs. That was never the point. Richard Nixon uh, enacted the war on drugs, pushed the war on drugs, to disrupt his political enemies. And I'm going to be reading uh, from a quotation uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to pull that up right now. Uh, so this quotation comes from uh, Nixon's domestic policy chief. His name is John Ehrlichman. And he told this to a writer for Harper uh, in an interview. The writer's name is Dan Bowen. Uh, and you'll have all this information in, uh, in the slides if you like. Uh, but this is the quotation. In his words, he says, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. And those are the words from John Ehrlichman, Nixon's domestic policy chief. And this is important for the reason that Nixon was not trying to reduce addiction. So no amount of arguing about what would reduce addiction was going to change Nixon's mind. The whole point was that it, uh, helped Nixon preserve power by disrupting communities and political enemies. Uh, and that actually created the conditions for increased addiction and uh, capitalism. Anytime the system sees a way that it can uh, enhance power for itself, uh, will run away with it. Um, the uh, war on drugs actually further profits capitalism because now that we have oppressed communities who are, uh, we've raised their addiction rates as well, and we, we've uh, incarcerated them. That's, that is the beginning of mass incarceration uh, in the United States, where uh, now we have all this free labor in prisons, and now we can just use them to do what we want. Um, and uh, every prison built in the United States is a factory where workers' rights do not exist. Um, and, and I want to be clear, people are doing that work of, of, uh, prison laborer, prisoner organizing and pushing back on that, but that is how the system of capitalism sees this and why capitalism determines what, uh, is allowed to move forward and grow and what is, uh, is violently oppressed and, and pushed down. And that is why, uh, we have these increased addiction rates because it profits capitalism to do so. Um, and you'll notice, of course, that uh, some substances and behaviors that we might call compulsive uh, are violently oppressed and tamped down, and other uh, uh, substances and, and behaviors that we might call compulsive um, are actually encouraged, uh, like workaholism. There's a whole hustle and grind culture that is allowed to exist. Coffee, right? The fact that people have uh, that addiction is, but it, it is one that benefits capitalism. Um, and so the, the, some are criminalized and some are not, uh, but the, at, a, at, a, at an institutional society level, 
uh, all of this profits capitalism and and allows it to keep going and capitalism allows those to keep going um cool so that is the bulk of the presentation i'm gonna leave you here with uh, some reflection questions uh if you were in uh the uh, live workshop with us, you'd be talking about these reflection questions uh, in small groups in Breakout and Zoom. Um, but here I just leave them for you to reflect on. Uh, this here is the Tree of Contemplative Practices. I just offer this because um, you don't have to uh, think about these questions just sitting still like a, like a Zen uh, meditation practitioner you can also do it in uh reflect in a, in an artistic reflection or uh in community or in movement mindfulness like walking around or stretching what whatever uh so i leave that there for you to reflect on however uh is the your best way um but the reflection question i offer to you uh there are two one is uh what compulsions might I experience that help me de-stress in the short term, but create stress in the long term, right? So maybe you don't have something that could be clinically called an addiction, um, but I think we all experience compulsions. We all experience uh, something that uh, helps us reduce the default mode network that then we're more likely to use in maybe a way that we could call problematic. Maybe not every time we do that, it's problematic, um, but... Uh, but I leave that there as a question for you um, to, and I, yeah, I'll talk about that a little after. And then the next question I, I have for you is uh, what reconnections or investments in my whole health can I make to reduce the compulsive force? If you remember, right, those, there's the nine different things that Johan Hari leaves us and there's the whole health Karen that Lisa Rankin gives us. How can we invest in those things? How can we make those reconnections into those things? so that uh, we actually create a default mode network uh, that we are more comfortable being in and that we're not trying to run away from. Um, and the thing I wanna say, I actually just presented this talk to the sober faction of the Satanic Temple. Um, and I got a question I hadn't thought of in a while, which was, what do I think of the disease model of addiction? And so, it. Uh, I had some thoughts on it and I want to share that here too, is that um, firstly, the disease model is an improvement on the moral model of, of addiction, that you, you are a personal failure as an individual if you become addicted to something that is disgusting and fucked up and wrong. Um, and I think that there are some shortcomings of the disease model in that um, it strikes me as very binary. Uh, where some people are addicts and they have this disease called addiction and some people don't have this disease called addiction and, and they're not addicts. And that means if like, if I happen to not have an addiction and I happen to not be an addict, then that means I'm fine, right? I'm healthy. Whereas I would actually argue we all experience these compulsions and we all experience trauma and we're all uh, sometimes trying to run from trauma and sometimes addressing our trauma. And I think if we more frame things that way, um, then we can be more honest about what institutionally works and what doesn't, as well as more honest with ourselves about uh, what are we running from and what can we do about it. Um, so I offer that. Uh, cool. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, I also leave you with this quotation on the reflection questions. I always like to end with this. Uh, radical educator John Dewey says, we don't just learn from experiences, we learn from reflecting on the experience. And I would argue we need to do that reflection in conversation, in community with others. So I encourage you all to have these conversations with other people. Thank you so much for joining this. I'm just gonna do now the, the resources walkthrough so that y'all can see uh, uh, where you might continue uh, learning about this. The stuff in the lower left there is stuff more specific to political economy in general, or uh, me and my sex bio specifically. Uh, so please do check those things out there. Um, then the stuff on the right here, Stuart McMillan uh, does those web comics that I uh, took little screenshots of. Um, 
Rat Park is an excellent documentary that's hard to see right now. It's only available on a Canadian streaming platform, but I leave you with the trailer and some behind the scenes footage that get into those conversations. Lisa Rankin uh, has the presentation and an article about her approach to whole health. Uh, do check those out. Um, and then we also have uh, a lot of stuff from Johan Hari. He's done a lot of uh, interviews and presentations about this. He's got the two books, Chasing the Scream and Lost Connections, uh, and either one of which he's done a lot of presentations and interviews on. So check those out for sure. Um, the upper part is the uh, part where he's talking about addiction and then starting at depression and anxiety is talking about those. Um, and then I leave you here with, you have Dr. Carl Hart, who does really awesome uh, uh, work. He's a, a neuroscientist uh, who is also a, a uh, uh, drug uh, rights and reform advocate. Uh, so really awesome stuff there, as well as Gabor Mate. I referenced his uh, compulsion to buy uh, classical music CDs before. Uh, he's got really powerful stuff. And then in that other section, um, that uh, that first article there, Meth Problems Fester Without Housing First, is actually written by uh, someone who has addiction to meth. And I would definitely encourage reading that. It's uh, got some... Uh, uh, personal experience in there, as well as uh, institutional arguments about policy changes. Um, and then that one comic book, Cannabis, is the history of the criminalization of cannabis, uh, which is an excellent, excellent look at that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, two, uh, two papers there on the different models of alcohol and drug use. Um, and and the concept of addiction and and those models that gets into like the moral model versus the disease model and some other things some other other kinds of stuff there. Um, so I thank you so much uh, for attending uh, and and watching. Uh, check us out at my sex bio. Look at their other stuff. They do great work. Um, check out my other videos if you like. Whatever it is you want to uh, share with people is great. Uh, thank you. Deep gratitude, and I will see you all at the next uh, at the next one. Cheers.